Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Vatican City, also known as the Holy See. It's very particular definitions between the two, but they're not really that different, so don't worry about it. Um, it's interchangeable for the most part. Vatican City and the Holy See. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you can pretty much use whatever. The difference is too slight to even go over. So, what is Vatican City besides the world's smallest nation state? It is the headquarters of the Catholic Church and the most holy site of the Catholic Church. This is where the Pope lives and works, and the Pope is the man, it's always a man, it has to be, it's tradition, who controls the Catholic Church around the world. This is where it all happens. So, um, we're going to talk a lot about why things are the way that they are in its history, but first let me go over some geography. I'm actually going to start with not the obvious part of Vatican City. I'm going to start with the wall. The wall was built uh, bit by bit as the Vatican expanded throughout the years. The wall, of course, is very important because it designates its border. Vatican City is located within the city of Rome in the country of Italy. It is totally enclosed. There's no shoreline or anything like that. No rivers, no lakes, nothing like that. So the, the wall is interesting. The wall has its own history and expansions and, you know, things like that. There's secret tunnels and things, of course. There's a lot of secrets in the Vatican City. <laughs> a lot of secrets. That uh, people on the outside aren't meant to know, but there are various tunnels and things involved with the walls. I think that's pretty cool. And there are some spots where the wall breaks, mainly right here. This is like a, a back entrance if you want to ignore all of the, the, the fancy fancy up in the front. But the main entrance right here, there's actually a line in the ground right there that separates the Vatican from Rome, and you don't need a passport to get in. You can just walk over it. There's no real border patrol. There are police that monitor the area. You know, if you try to commit crimes in St. Peter's Square, you got to deal with the Italian police. But there is no passport, no border control or anything like that. So, here is St. Peter's Square. It is a very remarkable piece of architecture, which of course we're going to talk about in its history. I should note real quick on a personal note, the first personal note of this video. The very first college course that I took was a just for fun. It was humanities in the arts. And one of the first things we did in my very first college class was break down the meaning of the architecture of St. Peter's Basilica. St. Peter's Square. And I re very clearly remember my professor saying that these columns here were meant to reach out and encircle the crowds and hug them in and welcome them in to the church. And, you know, I, I can't not see it anymore. It's really nice, I think. Beautiful columns right here with statues adorning the top. There's two fountains here. In the middle, you can see is the obelisk course we're going to talk about in its history. This would be where the Pope would give speeches and sermons and everyone can stand out here and watch. It is a very massive place. I know it's the world's smallest nation state, but it is huge right here. So here is St. Peter's Basilica, the main church of the Catholic faith. You can't tell from here, but the building has a cross shape to it which is done on purpose, obviously. And it holds some of the most beautiful 
works of art and architecture. You can find the uh, Pieta sculpture in here by Michelangelo, the Tomb of St. Peter, which is a, a remarkable piece. We went over that in my art history class too, and all the details of it. It's incredible. It is a stunning, stunning building. And after we go over history, I'll grab my tablet and I'll show you some tours inside and outside the basilica here. There's a huge dome on the top, the world's largest dome, and it's just a remarkably beautiful building. I have never been there, but I want to so bad, even though, here's the other personal note, I am not Catholic, I am not Christian, I'm not associated with this religion whatsoever. I have been to a few, um, see, I don't even know the word for it, sermons, I think, uh, with friends who are Christian, and I've been to a Catholic service, I guess, um, but I don't know the nitty-gritty religious details of things. I know historical things, I know, you know, who does what and where and why, but I've never read the Bible, so I don't know a lot of the actual religiousness to it, if that makes any sense, so... Forgive me if I seem very, like, I'm trying not to say dumb, <laughs> very unaware of the religious implications of certain things, because this is not my department. <laughs> anyway, moving out from the Basilica, what dominates the rest of Vatican City are the gardens here, and they are very lush and beautiful and very well maintained. I'll show you on Google Earth, there's like an Italian-themed garden and a French-themed garden and lots of beautiful fountains and um, you know, various relics and reconstructions of different religious, important sculptures and things. Also in the gardens, you can find the Vatican radio station. And, uh, let's see what else. Oh, the government building. That's kind of important. This is where the actual, like, meat of the politics of Vatican City happens. Here is the railroad station. Yes, Vatican City has its own railroad. You can ride this little chug-a-choo-choo -choo train. It's really cute. In and out of the city. You have your own little transport there. You can also see around here lots of various, um, like, this over here is the, uh, like, the, the papal buildings, like, where the Pope actually lives, but these are, like, the other kind of, like, offices and things, <laughs> various churches in here, too. Of course, like, the, uh, the Apostolic Palace, that's what it's called, over here, this is a big parking lot, you'll see on Google Earth. But attached to it is the Sistine Chapel, most likely the most famous ceiling in the world, right in there. Over here are the Vatican Museums. Parts of it are open to tours, but uh, it's very restricted and very limited, and there are many places that people are not allowed to go. Like I said, there's a lot of secrets within the Vatican and lots of various different offices of, of archbishops and other important people involved in working in the Vatican. Let's see, where is the Swiss Guards? Right here. The barracks of the Swiss Guards. I talked about this in my Switzerland episode, but the Pope has a bodyguard of Swiss Guards. Back in the day, since the Swiss were neutral, they would hire out soldiers to various countries to do tasks, and the Pope did that at one point, and they are still there, doing their thing, guarding the Pope personally. Hmm, let me see. Oh, I have a note in my notes about the gardens. One other thing which what I call whenever I'm tutoring is not an actual factual fact. <laughs> it makes the kids laugh. So an actual factual fact is something that really did happen. 
So if you can't prove it, then it's not an actual factual fact. But allegedly, the gardens, some of the soil in the gardens, came from the hill where Jesus was crucified. Again, that's not an actual factual fact. It's not really... At least I don't believe so. But it's believed that soil was brought from... I mean, soil was brought in from, like, <laughs> what is now Israel, Jerusalem, all that. But, um, who knows if it was the actual factual soil, right? There's a lot of mythology involved in Vatican City, and again, I am very ignorant about <laughs> what it means on a deeper level. Uh, but it's still very interesting. Let's talk about its history. Let's get into it. It's a very interesting I know I always say that, but come on, this it's Vatican City. <laughs> so before this was anything, when Rome was just starting out, this area was a big marshy yuck near the Tiber River. It was very undesirable. The Romans did not like this area. The water was bad. Any wine that was produced near here was not very good. So for Rome's early history, it was ignored, and many, many, many years later, it was eventually drained to build villas. Emperor Caligula's mom, before he was Emperor Caligula, built a villa on this area, so he was always very partial to it. I think he must have inherited it at some point. When he was emperor, I think he was emperor, yeah, there's emperors at this point, Caligula. He built a charioteer circus on there, and um, if you don't know about the chariot races of the Roman Empire, it was like the sport. People were obsessed. There were teams, kind of like Formula One had their own teams, you know, of like various races and sponsors. People had colors. There were the rivalries. There were fights among fans. Everything you know in like modern sports today, that was pretty much what chariot racing was all about in ancient Rome. So it was very exciting. Caligula built his own chariot circus. You can kind of understand the shape. Now, I just watched Ben Hur the other day. That was a trip of a movie, but man, the, the chariot racing was very impressive. And um, if you've seen that or know a little bit more about chariot racing, it is a big circle, hence the the term circus and in the middle you have like a statue or something just to make it look nice so Caligula brought an obelisk from Egypt to put in the middle to make it very fancy and that's what it was for the longest time until the year 64 CE when the great fire of Rome broke out Rome was pretty much wrecked after this fire it's not really known actual factual how it started but it it spread horribly and burned a lot of the city and it was rumored that the emperor at the time emperor nero actually started the fire so that he could rebuild the city to his liking which he fervently denied um there's actually some historians that totally believe that's what happened but it's not actual factual fact nero denied this wholeheartedly with his old chest and said that it was actually the Christians that started the fire. The, those horrible, horrible Christians. <laughs> anyway, that's how he described it. So people were very, very mad. There was a man that was in charge of the Christians in the area named Peter. Peter, who <laughs> would become Saint Peter. He was, to put it bluntly, crucified on the obelisk here. He was hung upside down apparently because he didn't want to uh, hang in the same position as Jesus did. But yikes, that sounds even worse than being crucified right side up. And he was buried, allegedly, on the, the hill over here. And thus it remained for quite a while. It was a graveyard for the longest after the fire. A mostly a Christian graveyard for Christians who were tried of, you know, crimes wrongly, of course. And there have been various excavations and things. There have been very old uh, burials discovered 
in this area over here, and one of which is alleged to be St. Peter. And yeah, so that's that's the best truth we can get from that. So, flash forward to the next emperor that's important in our story, Emperor Constantine. At this point, the Roman Empire had grown so big, it was impossible to control all of it, so it was split in two, with the Western Roman Empire being ruled from Rome, and the Eastern in Byzantium, which is now Istanbul. But Emperor Constantine ruled from there, he renamed it Constantinople after himself. But he really saw the lights of Christianity and embraced it and made it illegal or he made it legal to be Christian in the Roman Empire and would eventually make it the official religion of the Roman Empire. I wrote my notes for this video like a week ago while I was on vacation and I wrote Constantine loves Christianity. <laughs> so yeah, he was all about it. He thought it was amazing and really fully embraced it and encouraged all of his citizens throughout the empire to embrace it as well. So he donated a lot of land in and around Rome. The land around Rome would eventually become the early version of the Papal States, which would grow and expand uh, over most of the southern peninsula of Italy. He also donated a lot of buildings throughout Rome to the church. And he donated this land and the original St. Peter's Basilica built on the tomb of St. Peter was, um, I think, begun in the year 326. It, it doesn't look anything like it does now. <laughs> that would come later. And thus the, the popes would follow in Peter's footsteps. Peter was technically the first pope, so after he was killed he was replaced by another pope and so on until today like it's still going <laughs> that chain of tradition is still going on since all that time ago the power of the church would become very political in the year oh gosh what was it 800 900 i forgot 800 right charlemagne it's the year 800 anyway it's it's one of those facts that's just stamped on my brain and of course i'm Anyway, you know, the church was very political before that, but it became a whole different thing after Charlemagne conquered the Lombards up in northern Italy and would essentially save the Western Roman Empire from the various barbarians that came in and ransacked most of the empire in the western half. The eastern half, of course, was flourishing, but the, the, the barbarians, which at that time just meant people who didn't speak Latin were coming in and attacking. Charlemagne, who was a uh, part of the tribe known as the Franks, which is now the French, right, um, came in and liberated Lombardy from the Lombards. And the Pope recognized that achievement by crowning him Holy Roman Emperor. So the emperor of the territories he conquered as approved by the Pope. And that's where the phrase Holy Roman Empire comes from. It would grow and shift and change in definition throughout the years, but that is how that started. That's why it was called the Holy Roman Empire, even though the center of the empire was never in Rome. The power of the Pope was in Rome. Eventually, in 1506, it was time to redecorate, and the Vatican had received a lot of money at this point, uh, questionable means, you know, um, when people would come saying, uh, forgive me, Father, I have sinned, they'll be like, yeah, just write a check and you'll be forgiven. So they had accumulated a lot of money, and in the like very beginnings of the Italian Renaissance, the the peoples and the the Pope, I guess, at the time in charge was like, let's redecorate. Let's let's spruce this place up a lot. And the new basilica was built. It was the whole area was built and designed by many different artists and architects, but the most famous 
who completed the work was Michelangelo Buonarroti, uh, who painted the Sistine Chapel by hand up on scaffolding, reaching up, craning his neck, painting the ceiling. He designed lots of architecture and created many, many, many of the famous statues within and around the Basilica. There is also the altar of St. Peter, designed by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. It's, again, I'll show you on the tablet. It's, it's so interesting because it's such a contrast from the, the basilica is very bright and elegant and beautiful and the tomb is very dark and the style is completely different from the rest of the building and it stands out so much. It's so interesting. Uh, but there are many other artists and architects that worked on the Vatican. And like I said, it expanded throughout the years. It had expanded out before this, but that's when the reach really started to grow and grow until uh, it reached this limit. I didn't write down the year, but yeah. Let's flash forward to 1870. There is a unification of Italy movement happening. And there are various freedom fighters moving their way up the peninsula. And they reach Rome in 1870 and capture it. And you know, thus making it part of the new Italy, a brand new country. So the Pope did not live in the Vatican at this time. He lived in... A Place whose name I forgot. I'm so sorry. Uh, another um, building slash palace within Rome. So he had to flee that. The freedom fighters essentially forced him into the Vatican to live here. And once the dust settled from the revolution and Italy became a thing, there was sort of an unspoken rule to not bother the Pope with fighting and politics and all that, just let him be within the walls here, let him just do his thing. And uh, they did not allow any secular power for the Vatican or for the Pope at this time. Essentially, the, the whole concept of like a Holy Roman Empire where the, the emperor was the spiritual leader, that, that was over at this point. In 1929, February 11th, 1929, the King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, along with the Prime Minister at the time, Benito Mussolini, signed a treaty with the Pope known as the Lateran Treaty, and it made the Vatican an independent state. And this had to be done because they really just didn't know what to do with the Pope at this time, you know, he's very important integral part, not just to Rome and Italy, but the, the church, the entire Catholic population of the world. So, you know, it was, it was tricky. How do we administer this area? Do we absorb it? What would the Pope do? What do we do about the buildings? So they just agreed just to let it be its own thing and it would have its own rules separate from Italy. Um, to an extent, they still had the police patrolling various parts of it to keep it safe but it became its own thing at this point which was very important during World War II the Vatican officially stayed neutral the Pope was very much against the bombing of Rome which happened anyway but thankfully the Vatican was spared and essentially it's pretty much where we are today in terms of history the most recent pope was elected in 2013. His name is Pope Francis. Um, very interesting character. The only pope to have come from a, like, not just a South American country, but like a Spanish-speaking country. So that's pretty cool. He's a neat guy. There's a really good movie called The Two Popes because the pope before him resigned Traditionally, you're supposed to wait for the Pope to die to elect the next Pope, but he resigned amid various church scandals that we're not going to talk about on an ASMR channel, but it's a really good movie. Um, a little slow, but it picks up toward the end. It's worth watching, I think. You get to see a lot of the beautiful landscapes of the Vatican and the gorgeous, gorgeous gardens here. Um, 
But yeah, you know, when they elect a pope, they go into a special area. Um, I think within... I actually don't know what building it's in. It's in this area here because everyone gathers in the square to wait for the signal. And they, you know, write the name of who they want to be pope on a piece of paper. Someone counts them all. And if it doesn't add up to the right amount, they burn it in like a, a special furnace that produces black smoke and um, once there is a consensus it's burned in another special furnace that would produce white smoke so everyone would see the white smoke coming out and they would start celebrating because the new pope was elected and for the most part that's the history of the Vatican City um, I really try to find more actual factual facts about the Vatican City, but it, it, like I said, it's mostly mythology and stories and conspiracies and not a lot of actual factual facts, but the ones that I did find were very interesting in my opinion. Let me go grab my tablet and I'm going to show you some amazing aerial pictures of Vatican City and some interior shots as well. Oops, when did I tap? Something. <laughs> anyway, here we are at the Vatican. Let me zoom out so you can kind of see. Let me like put a pin on something. Of course, I accidentally tap on things all the time. But when I actually want to tap on something, there we go. Okay, so you can see the red tap there. And big city of Rome. Let me zoom out, zoom out, zoom out so you can see exactly where we are in the world. There's Italy. That's where the Vatican is. Let's go back in there. You can see it highlighted. The Vatican. So, let me whoop, slow down. Slow your roll there. Okay. Google Earth has this really amazing 3D view of Check it out. It's so neat. So let's start at the beginning over here. You can see there's the dividing line there. And we enter St. Peter's Square, which is not a square, but what else? Details, details. You can see the amazing columns, those hugging arms that my humanities professor mentioned wrapping around the various crowds there. Here's the big obelisk. Um, I'd show you like um, little street views, but people have taken some really terrible pictures of the Vatican, so I'll show you something a little later. But this is the obelisk. Isn't that neat? Um, go over here to you know where the Pope would give sermons and things. And here is the Basilica. It's this big old dome. <laughs> and, oh, and then if I go like this, you can see the, the cross. Isn't that neat? Over here is the Sistine Chapel. You can see Capella Sistina. There's that big parking lot I told you about. <laughs> With the, uh, the papal palaces and libraries and museums all throughout here. There's a the little entrance. It's over here. Where are they? Somewhere over here. I think we're, yes, I think they're here. Okay. Moving on to the gardens. Let me zoom you over here so you get a better view of some of the gorgeous fountains, statues, Topiary. Over here is the French garden. Very, very French. <laughs> and over here is the Italian garden. Very, very Italian. <laughs> so detailed. Every tiny little detail. And look what's over here. It's a tiny chugga chugga choo choo train station. It literally looks like if you've been to Disneyland, the Casey Jr. <laughs> without the little like greenery around it to make your little ride pretty. It's like that. Isn't that interesting? Going right into there. 
Very cool, I think. There's the radio station tower. And you can see a lot of the wall here. Um, like I said, the wall has its own rich history. There's the, the official papal helipad. <laughs> and yeah, isn't that interesting? Let's see, let's see. I'm trying to ignore the car revving at the engine outside. <laughs> but we have um, more statues, more beautiful buildings. Here's the government building. The little double key symbol of the Vatican right there. So we make our way back. And there it is, the world's smallest um, nation state. Its own city state. It's one of those places where it's like, what's the capital of the Vatican? It is the capital. <laughs> Not much else to it other than that. So, um, like I said, there's some really rotten pictures that people have taken. Hello, car. There he goes. Okay. A lot of, the car agrees. A lot of rotten pictures that people have taken inside. They are not good. A lot of, like, street views are tagged as being in here, but they're actually, like, over here. <laughs> it's not good. So, here's what I found. Guess who came through for me for the channel? The Vatican's website, vatican.va. Let's start off checking out the inside of St. Peter's Basilica. So we're starting with the apps, which is right here. And it is this gorgeous, like, hello, it's beautiful, right? I, I used the doves the intro <laughs> in this it's, there's so much to it, like, the, there's details and sunshine and everything, and then when you zoom out, it just looks like an explosion of light, right? It's so beautiful. This big old, I guess it's like a, an altar, I suppose. I don't know. But you could also see all of the absolutely incredible detail, like, wow. Let me full screen. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> A big organ there. And as we make our way around, here's the tomb of St. Peter, which we're going to look at in a little bit more detail. And there's... Oh, it's so big. <laughs> it's so overwhelming. And like, every single corner is detailed, right? Not a single spot has been left undecorated, untouched. altar right here. So, we are inside of it. I didn't even know you could go inside of it, but I guess like official people have taken these pictures. There's the beautiful dove of peace again. I guess symbolizing God, like always watching over you, you know? Beautiful symbol of peace. So yeah, I guess when we're so close, it's hard to see the contrast, but you can kind of see it. How this is very like dark wood. The styles are completely different from the rest of the architecture. Um, it's very almost like a Byzantine style in a way. Tiny little, little, little details all around it, little cherubs and things. And um, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful beautiful structure. There's the big dome at the top there. Ugh, it, it reminds me of like, you know, in Animal Crossing when people do their entire island and there's not one corner that hasn't been touched. That's what th this building reminds me of. Every single little square inch of this building is beautiful. Incredible, right? Like, so many obscure details in this part of the building. It's so interesting. And then, of course, the, the tomb would be right under here. <laughs> Let me see what else I want to show you. Oh, we have to see La Pieta. Um, probably by far, like, the most famous statue within the Vatican. Carved by Michelangelo. They've got a glass wall there, so you can't get close, but it is this incredible example of renaissance marble sculpture 
And this is Mary holding the dead Jesus, her son. Looking very sad, obviously. Her, her son was killed horrifically, right? So what's really interesting about this, not in... I mean, from, a, from an art standpoint, it's an incredibly, like, human, very relatable moment of a very ancient, retold billion times event, right? It, it's like, this is what would have actually, it would have actually looked like. Like, not the fancy um, artworks from, like, the ancient Byzantine and even, like, the Orthodox icon artwork where it's just, like, Mary and Jesus, like, next to each other. It's very human, right? It's very relatable. You, you feel the emotion coming out of that. You feel her sadness. Not to mention, I wish I could zoom in closer, but the details in the marble to make this look like cloth is wild. Michelangelo was very good at doing marble cloth. There were only a few Renaissance artists in Italy who could really pull it off, and Michelangelo was one of them. Incredible to make it look like, because this came from a rock, right? And to give it that much emotion and beauty and detail is remarkable. So it's in this little hallway here for you to see. Lots of tourists there today. And like it's such an incredible building, right? Every tiny detail. Look at the floors. Look at all the little marble beads there. And it's, it's incredible. <laughs> this place is amazing. Every detail, every single one, right? Let's look outside. Let's look at um, the pictures of St. Peter's Square is at night. Look at this one. Look what they did here. Someone, someone at running the Vatican's website learned a trick and they enjoyed it way too much. <laughs> if this is ever going to load, come on. There we go. Look at the fountain. Ooh. Can see the water moving. Very nice of Bravo to whoever coded that into the picture. So you can see it's actually really pretty at night. I never really see pictures of this place at night. It adds a whole different ambiance to it. The big columns encircling you. You can see there's so many statues, I'm sure, of very famous people in the Bible and Christian history. I wouldn't know a single one. This is not my area, right? There's the big obelisk, and yeah, big fountains. Just to kind of give you a, a sense of the scale of this place, like this is a tiny country, right? But the structures here are so massive and so beautiful. Let's check out the Sistine Chapel, because um, this place is a trip. Again, Michelangelo Buonarroti hand painted all this. I mean, he had assistants, but he was the one in charge. He had to get up on scaffolding, reach up, and paint the ceiling. It took him years and years and years, and um, there's actually a really interesting movie. <laughs> I love movies, so there's a cool movie called The Agony and the Ecstasy that kind of shows his descent into madness as he painted this room. Um, but so many naked people. I mean, that was, that was the style back then, you know. Um, here's a famous picture of God right there. There's a butt. <laughs> but he, there is God creating the world, I believe. That's what this is meant to be. And there he is checking out his creation. And then here he is giving life to Adam. Probably one of the most famous paintings of all time. It's definitely up there. I remember my art history teacher being like, what does this shape remind you of? Like, there's the brainstem, you know, there's the frontal lobe. It's a brain. It's a brain. Very symbolic, right? Um, if we look on this side, we can see another really famous painting that's upside down. I can't turn it. Um, of the snake. And I like this interpretation that it's, you know, it's supposed to be Satan, I'm pretty sure, but you usually see it as a snake, but it's like a, a serpent man, 
It's really interesting. And then they're there getting cast out. Of the Garden of Eden for eating the fruit off the tree, being tempted by the snake. And they're pleading, like, sorry. <laughs> I assume that's what that is. I'm not sure. There's also lots of really incredible artwork on the sides here. You can see there's Jesus giving a sermon to the crowds here on a lovely day. Here he is again. Again, I don't know any of the details. I, 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 I don't know. I'm pretty sure this is him getting baptized, right? That's what that has to be. Let me show you this one over here that's kind of confused me. Can someone tell me what this is supposed to be. I've been staring at this. We have these warriors here on horseback. They are drowning in this river of like, it looks like mud. There's a ship sinking in it. Their city back here is being rained all over. It's being flooded. And on this side, they're like, LOL. <laughs> We're having a great time over here, enjoying everything. And they're, they're going up into the hills. So, like, my only thought is that this must be Moses, the Red Sea. But, like, um, look, there's even, they've even got a rainbow and everything in the background. But, like, all these pictures are of the life of Jesus, and Moses was, like, way, way, way before Jesus, so I don't know why that would be here. So, if anyone knows what this is supposed to be, let me know, because, um, I've been scratching my head. Like, is it supposed to be, like, I know the story of, like, Sodom and Gomorrah. Is that what that is? I don't know. I do not know. Again, just, like, the, the intricacies of this place is so beautiful. And Michelangelo designed all of it. The floors here. Over here's the actual chapel, you know. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful building. So, yeah. That's going to be it for tonight. <laughs> Wasn't this interesting? I think so. Thank you so much for watching. Tomorrow we'll go over the history of the rest of Italy. Except for San Marino. But you know what I mean. We'll go over Italy's history. And I think a lot of events in this history section will make more sense. But thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you find this video relaxing and educational. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on the Italy. And I hope that you have a very good, good, good